morning. Oh, I got no one. Good morning. How is everyone? Um, I heard an amazing. Is anybody else amazing? All right. Well, welcome to church. Wow. You guys are like dead this morning. Welcome to church. (laughs) There we go. You guys, he just wants you to be really happy with him today because it's his birthday. So... She had to say it. Yep, I'm 25 plus. Woohoo! <laughs> um, if you would, we have a couple operational things before we um, before we step into worship. Um, first, welcome. Like I said, thank you for coming to church. I think that. Yeah. Um, can we stand? Um, if you have kids who are three years and younger, we do have nursery available. It is due west from here, so in the hallway. Um, I don't remember the other operational things, but that's okay. Uh, this week, putting the, the worship set list together was... I actually had it together a few weeks ago, and... I've been feeling through the week. It's it's a different start. So I've been asking God, God, what like what do you want for today? And we all do that as worship leaders. We're we're seeking his heart throughout the week of what do you want to do this week? What do you want to hone in on? What do you want to say on Sunday, Lord, to your people? Um and I got the scripture in Jude. Verse um 24 it says now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever amen verse 24 really stuck out to me. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. And I've just been hearing, you're already there. You're already faultless. And I really feel like if we can just dim the lights, they don't have to be off, but this is going to be a different start, and I really feel like God wants to, speak that into us today, so if you can find a spot where it's just you and him, it could be sitting, it could be standing, it could be in the back corner, facing the corner, it doesn't matter. You're here for a reason today. And he knew you were coming. And if you're online, the same thing. He knew you were going to tune in today. And he's already presented you faultless. Because the work of the cross is already done. The veil was torn. I'm going to say that again. The veil was torn so that we can walk in. So if you need to close your eyes to get just with him, Lord, we just picture you. In our mind's eye, we just picture you. We picture the throne room of heaven. I thank you for every heart here, every mind, every soul. Thank you that no matter what, you're always drawing us. God, I thank you that your word says that we've been placed 
at your right hand as heirs. Shall we just step in this morning? We step into your presence. We thank you that you've presented us faultless. White as snow. There's no striving, no works that can get us there or has ever gotten us there. Holy Spirit, we just invite you here this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We turn our hearts toward you today. We turn our hearts toward you today.
say it to him.
know what you've spoken. I'm already loved more than I could imagine. And that is enough. That is enough. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. I know who I am. I know what you saw. somebody in here who doesn't believe that. And this isn't just a blanket statement. There's somebody specific in here who doesn't believe that. Because he is enough. His grace is enough. For me. His mercy is enough. There's no striving. I just kept hearing that and hearing that over again, and we're going to sing it until we get it, until I get it. We don't have to strive to receive what he wants to give. You don't have to put on the best clothes and show up here and look so great and smile at everybody and be so happy, bubbly, filled with the love of whatever to receive his love. So if you are bankrupt in it, just pick up 
what the kingdom of heaven's currency is offering right now. <laughs> hmm. Chosen, I'm 
into your courts with praise. We come before you, ancient of days. Have your way. We're vessels of honor, fit for your use. Come and do what you want to do. Closer than 
greater love than laying your life down. That's our king. That's our friend who walks closer than a brother. Jesus, I thank you that you bind every broken heart. I thank you that you meet us right where we are. And by what can only be described as supernatural, you take us from that place where we are. You scoop us up. And you put us in right standing with Abba Father. So, Father, I thank you for this restoration. Jesus, I praise you for your sacrifice, which makes it possible. It's real. Lord, I thank you for this gentle spirit here today. Paul Galt shared with us that his son fell off a bar stool last night at his house, not at a bar, and hit his head and had seizures really badly. This is his grown son, and he's doing a little better, but not a lot. And the Galts aren't here today. I'm sure they're attending to that. But somebody... I'm sure they're watching now or they're going to watch um, the precious family here. Somebody that knows Paul and Mary really well, would you come up here and stand in for them? Friends of Paul and Mary. Come up here and stand. Steve going to do it. Come on now. One or two others is fine. Okay, Steve, Steve and Susan, Chris, good. Church, come gather around here. Especially if you've... Uh, been healed of seizures, or someone in your family has. Gather up here. Let's pray. Family prays. Jesus, we just speak your healing flow into their son in Jesus' name. We speak the healing manna of God over his mind, over his brain, over his body, over the function of his organs in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I just declare your healing, um, even one that the best of surgeons can do, Lord, you, even greater than that, Lord, would do a miracle and a sign and a wonder in this young man and this gentleman, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that there would be no other issues, no more trauma from that incident. It would be done. It will be finished in the mighty name of Jesus. And we just declare full freedom through this in the name of Jesus. The mind function even better than ever before in the name of Jesus. Memory better than ever before in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And Father, we lift up Rich who has throat cancer. We pray, Father God, that you would reach out to him right now and you would lift him up in the name of Jesus and make him whole, Father. And thank you, Father. Tom's brother, Jeff, is here, the one we prayed for last week that had the motor motorcycle accident. His girlfriend is still, uh, she's doing better, but she's not all the way. So, Father God, we cry out to you. What's her name? Jeff? Mel. We cry out to you for Mel. This is Jeff right here. This is Jeff. We cry out to you for Mel right now in the name of Jesus. Lift her up from her bed. Full function, full responsiveness, Father God. Full faculty, body, mind, soul, and spirit in the name of Jesus. Heal her today on Father's Day. On Father's Day, God. On Father's Day. So that it can be said of you, Jesus. So that it can be said of you, Abba Father, that you're a loving Father. We know it's true. And we've opened the door for you to come through, God. Meet Mel right where she's at right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Amen.
Oh, we have a we have a Father who is just available to us to bring our petitions, our supplications, our prayers. He's right there. While we're praying, we're going to continue to pray for the complete and total healing and restoration of Alora Bratcher. She's got ups and she's got downs. It's been challenging, but we're watching that family and their extended family rally around in faith. So we pray strength and grace. Peace, Father God. Words of wisdom. Words of knowledge and how to pray in Jack and in Allison, mom and dad, and in Jim and Teresa, Allison's parents, and in John and Don Bratcher, Jack's parents. Father God, we pray, Father, their faith would be strong. We will stand with them and we will hold their, their hands high. We're going to hold their hands high because Allure is healing. We declare in the name of Jesus, her healing is ordained and appointed by you, God. I thank you, Father, that that is already done in your eyes. We will stand firm on it. Hi, guys. Children are amazing. Mike Bowerman just told me that his niece, Christy, just had a baby. Was it like yesterday, last night? I don't know. You can bring the lights up. So praise God for new life. Praise God for children. Hallelujah. Here, you can take that back. I don't want to lose it. Will you guys go sit down with your mama now, please? Thank you. Keep that. I don't want to lose it, okay? Go sit with your mama. Father's Day. So if you're visiting Fellowship of Believers, we really like family here. Amen? Family is everything here. Because you know what? What is the body of Christ if it's not family? Amen? It's really, really, really simple. Today is Josh's birthday. He just ran off from the stage. He ran away. When you see Josh later, give him a really hard time. It's his birthday. He just turned 25. I'll make, I'll make him tell you how. <laughs> it's okay. He's not 40 yet, and he's going to beat me there by a few months. So that's okay. Steve Wicker, Myrna Eilers, you both have a testimony? Come up here and share it real fast. Share it with the body, would you? Can we praise the Lord today? Kids, you're invited to go upstairs. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, Lee had had um, something happen, and she had to go to the hospital a week ago, and then they couldn't, they haven't found anything wrong, thank the Lord. Hallelujah. But they said she needs therapy, and she needs to be uh, go to a, a place to have therapy. So she's been into Hawthorne Village, and it's uh, strange territory to her, but she realizes that uh, what's happening is what she needs. And she's, and she's saying every day, she says, I know this is what I need, and that's good. But my concern was what happens on Saturday and Sunday when she doesn't have therapy. And so I woke up Friday just said, Lord, show me what to do. So I went in and I talked to the to the, the people who run the place, and they said no. I said, "Can we? Can I take her out?" No. I said, "Well, just for a little ride." No. And then I talked to the head of therapy, and she and she says, "That's part of therapy." And she said, "Well, we'll see if we can work something out." She said, "I'll let you know." Well, I'm waiting. Saturday hadn't heard anything, and I've asked several people, and they never heard anything. And so. Um, I went to find somebody else, and, and they said, I went to the head of the nurses. She says, I said, I want to take her to church tomorrow morning. She said, oh, you can do that. <laughs> Can't take her out on Saturday, but you can take her to church on Sunday. Hallelujah. I said, Lord, I'll take church on Sunday. So uh, I Saturday, I spent finding some different smaller clothes for her because she's lost a lot of weight. And I got all, and I, I was just, I went to see her and I'd tell her what's happened, and she's excited about that. And then I, I was said, I was just beat. I've been so tired. So I just went home and sat in the chair. I don't even know what time it was. And I fell into a deep sleep. And when I woke up, it was like, it was like a dusk. And I thought it was morning. And I said, and I said it's 7 o'clock. I said, Lord, it's 7 o'clock. Thank you for waking me up on time. 
And so I got went shaved and showered and did all of that and got everything got together thinking it's Sunday morning. <laughs> and I get into the I get in get in there and I, I said, Oh wow, arrived just at eight o'clock. And why don't the doors open? And so I called them and said, We'll open the doors. And they opened the doors. And I walked through the hall with Lee's little walker and I and I just said, I said, Good morning. And this nurse looks at me and says, no, it's oh. not morning. <laughs> and I was so excited, and I said, I just felt so good. I said, now what am I going to do? He said, she said, go tell your wife. So I did. And so fast forward. I, woke, I went to bed, and I had another good night's rest. <laughs> so I've had a lot of rest, and the Lord knew that's what I needed. Yeah. I needed deep rest. There's an old song came to me, said, oh, sweet rest. Oh, sweet rest. Tis the rest of the soul, so, so happy and blessed. By faith in his promise, I lean on his breast. My soul from its labor has found its sweet rest. And it goes on to say, Lord, we, I be, we just, we've been praying for you to come, Lord Jesus. Come. Then the next verse says, Lord. We don't need for you to come because you're dwelling here in us. We, this is the rest we have. We have the rest of Jesus in us. Well, you see, today, if anybody saw, I saw that well, I rolled in my wife, and she looks so beautiful and so rested. And I know God is going to complete that rest for her. And he's going to give her what she needs. She's going to make her joyful again and happy again. And that's what I'm asking you to pray, that God will completely give us all that sweet rest. So we're reminded this morning that he really is caring and he is loving. And so when we were singing the song about uh, Jireh and Jehovah Jireh, and Raj and I declared that almost every day in some form or another, but We've had some <clears throat> situations coming up in our lives. Uh, we had been missionaries to Eastern Europe for almost 30 years, and we need to get back to Poland. And um, we, we had somebody volunteer to give us their credit vouchers a while back, and we're, so we're just making sure, but we still need to know exactly the dates and all those kinds of things. So we've been walking through this. And, and so this week I was going back on that and discovered that there's almost enough to get us the whole international uh, section of that, so it's worth uh, over, you know, between about $2,500. And then we were just saying we have a, uh, our youngest granddaughter is getting married on the 10th of July, and we had made plans to go to leave like on the 2nd of July and spend a month with family, and we have some ministry things we need to do up there. But we're saying, God, we're adding all this stuff together, <laughs> and, and we don't know how to do this. Of course, we never do. But anyway, I just, just felt the tenderness of the Lord and uh, we were we ended up getting flights. Uh, we couldn't flying into Minneapolis had had almost doubled from when we were there before. It would cost somewhere between 450 and 650 per person. And uh, so, just one day, I just thought, well, I like to check on these things, but we just got dis discover we can fly Allegiant up to Des Moines, and we have college friends between there and Minneapolis, and so that saved us uh, probably 800 dollars by doing that. And then <laughs> this last week, we're, we were thinking, well to use a rental car for a month. You know, it's terrible right now, isn't it? It was well over $2,000, and we just thought, Lord, that's not even a good use of your money. <laughs> and so uh, it, the thought came to me, and I knew that it had to be Holy Spirit because I wouldn't have thought of this. He said, uh, check uh, the bus lines. <laughs> 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 well, I don't think about it very often. Most of you don't think traveling by bus maybe now anymore either, but we have to go up and see our daughter who's in Duluth, Minnesota, and so I just I went online to uh, Jefferson Lines, which is a Midwest company, and <laughs> it was $9 from Minneapolis uh, Airport to Duluth, $9 a piece on sun a Sunday morning, which is the time we need to go because of how it runs. The next one, we need to see my brother, and we have some ministry in central Minnesota. The next ticket was $28 per person, and then to get back <laughs> was $25 to the Mall of America, which picks us up with our kids. And I'm just laughing because instead of the over 2000 it's $122.94 for both of us. <laughs> and then I talked to my daughter, and I was telling her, and we were laughing about this because 
probably are, I, I do like to talk to strangers, and I believe that God has plans. You know, he puts us on these things, and uh, he has plans for people that ride those buses, including us. But anyway, I was telling Sarah, and she laughed, and she said, well, you know, Mom, I was just talking to my friend coming home from garage sale, and she said, you know, our, um, her friend was saying, our family's coming back, and they're bringing a car for our son to use for his driver's training. And, uh, but he doesn't need it till middle of August. So maybe your parents would like to borrow the car. And so we are, we are but we, are, we really want to take that bus. Now then Roger doesn't have to drive. I don't have to drive. We don't have to pay any of the gas. I mean, $122, that's a whole lot better, right? But we will have a car then to be able to visit our family whenever we want to. So we're just thanking God because he is Jaira. He's yeah. enough. Yeah. Amen. You know, there is just, there's no God like my God. Is he your God too? Not just mine, but he's mine to me. Okay, you know this like thing that happens when you're young, like when you're real young, when you're a kid, and uh, oh, it's, and you can, uh, you kind of have this thing like when you're with the neighborhood kids or, or you're in school and you're like, my dad's bigger than your dad or my dad can beat up your dad or whatever. Well, that's how I feel about God. He's mine. <laughs> it could be yours too, but he's mine, and he's the best. <laughs> we talk about, you're probably going to meet somebody on the bus. There's probably something, oh, there's more notes. There's notes flying all over my pockets today. We did that one already. You're probably going to meet somebody on the bus, and it's going to be like this incredible ministry opportunity, or something like that in the bus station, or you're going to eat at an Arby's between buses or something crazy. So when that happens, come back and tell us about that. So, like, my wife and I are building a house right now. It's going really well. It's really exciting. We're probably, I so hesitate to say when it will be done. At some point in the near future. <laughs> a few months, probably. Um, I failed a, uh, an inspection. I'm not going to share a lot of details about it, spe specifically because of some reasons but, um, that have to do with the, the person involved. But there was one of the many, many inspections with the county that we failed. Uh, we didn't fail many. It was just there's like 50 or 60 inspections with the county building department to build a house. And one of them failed. And I, I repented for this already, but I had a really bad attitude about it. I was like, this is not just. That's nonsense. Come on. But the Lord was like, shh. Okay. Sorry, God. So we did the couple things that we were told we had to do, and, and the guy came back a week later. This is a couple months ago. And it was kind of, he was kind of challenging the first time he came and challenging the second. He was abrasive. Anybody ever worked with somebody abrasive? Has anybody ever had to be at the mercy of somebody abrasive? It's hard. Okay. Lord, grant me humility. It was just, this is not the plan today. It just... Myrna, when you said the opportunities, I'm like, this has to happen today. I'm telling this story. I've been sitting on it. So the second time, this guy rolls around, county inspector. Uh, he comes in. He's like, yeah, you did the thing. And, you know, he had his laundry list of two or three things he wanted. And then for some reason, he starts for some reason, because of the Holy Spirit, he starts talking to me, telling me his life story. It's great. I got out of nowhere. And I'm like, it's 1,000 degrees. The house doesn't have air conditioning. This guy, I've been mad about him three quarters of the week prior. <laughs> I repented, but it was kind of touchy to me. This is my problem. But he starts telling me his life story, and I'm like, oh, there's, this is an opportunity. I understand now, God. Duh. You think you would see these things coming? I didn't that one. So these guys telling me his life story, and I'm listening. So my favorite witnessing tool is as guys... What do we do? What do you do for a living, right? It's really easy, you know. So he's telling me about his aspirations and his life's dreams. And, and, he, and I said, well, yeah, I'm a pastor. I used to be a tradesman, did construction like 10 years. Now I'm a pastor, full-time ministry. And he goes, you're a pastor? <laughs> yeah, I am. Can I talk to you? I said, yeah, of course you can. I mean, that's why I said it, but anyways. Church, he, he had a ball cap on, and he hung his head down real low. So I couldn't see his face when he talked because he had a ball cap on. And he said, Pastor, 
I was abused when I was three, five, and eight years old. My daddy left me when I was 11 years old, and I started drinking when I was 15. Been married for whatever, a certain amount of years, 20 years, and my wife just found out I was looking at pornography and drinking behind her back. She kicked me out of the house a week ago. Last night was the first night I spent in the house. He rattled it off just like that. We began to talk. Ministry began to flow. This guy had 50 inspections to do that day. It was first thing in the morning, and we sat there for an hour. And the power of the Holy Spirit fell. The, 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 there's no coincidence in the, coincidences in the kingdom. I was like, are you going to church anywhere? He goes, yeah, I go to this one church. He tells me where it is. It's up in Brandon. Get this. I was like, hey, is the pastor so-and-so? And he goes, yeah. I sat, I sat at a conference table with him another year, a couple years ago. I'm like, I know that guy. He's a great guy. Are you talking to him about this? He goes, yeah, we just had our first counseling session. So look at what, look at what Abba Father did in this guy's life. So he's, we, <laughs> he's feeling the love of God. We end our interaction with him on my shoulder, sobbing, tears going all down my back. A couple sweaty dudes that had never met before, <laughs> hugging it out, crying in the Lord. He's texting me later, <laughs> thanking me for, I'm like, look, man, it's the Lord. I'm nothing. God ordained this so that you could know he's still for you. Now, yeah, praise the Lord. Okay, but look, the next time something goes bad in your life, I remind you, this all started with a failed uh, inspection and a bad attitude on my part that I made right, and that repentance that humility opened the door for an incredible opportunity. I'll probably never see the guy again. Maybe, I don't know, probably not. It's not about that. Incred who, what, in Corinthians, who cares who waters? Who cares who waters? Who cares who fertilizes, cultivates? I don't remember the verse. It's the increase is the Lord's. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we could pack up shop right now, and we had good church. A couple things to tell you about really quick. After service today, it's Father's Day. Yeah. Father's Day is awesome. I'm partial to Father's Day. Gee, I wonder why. I love being a father. You're going to hear about that a lot today. That's okay. It's a good thing. So out in the family room, we're going to have what we call the pop shop. So after church, go out and get you a soda pop. Go get you some popcorn. Go get you, I don't know, ring pops. I'm not sure everything, but there's pop rocks. There's a bunch of sugary snack food that plays on the word pop out in the family room to enjoy with your kids today or with somebody else's kids or yourself. Thank you, Steve. You get yourself all sugared up. You just, you just have at it, by all means. This Saturday, six days from now, is our beach day and baptism. Right now, we don't have anybody signed up to baptize. That's totally cool. We'll still all go play in the water. But if you'd like to be baptized, uh, if your children haven't been baptized, come baptize your kids with us. If you have recently rededicated your life to the Lord, if you have kind of turned a corner, if you've had a major revelation, it's a great time to be baptized and reaffirm your faith. I put my money where my mouth is with that and got baptized on stage a few months ago. So... Sign up on Church Center or call the office if you'd like to be baptized. We like to have a heads up about who's doing that. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have a great time at the beach. And then Sunday, next Sunday, a week from today, is Family Sunday. So it's going to be a really fun church family weekend. After church, uh, there's like a family hang over at Richardson Park. And it's like bring your own chair, bring your own food. But, uh, you know, kids can play and, and hang out and all that stuff. So church is family. Amen. Amen. So before we get into the meat and taters, um, we're going to do some fun stuff today. I don't know if anybody likes my shirt, but I have a few more. Does anybody want a Father's Day shirt? Come on, you're going to have to raise your hands because I don't know what size these are. Here I come. I'm heading out. I'm doing it. Here we go. Rick Walker. That's an ex vastly overshot. <laughs> vastly overshot. I have to look at the sizes. You want to help me with this? Can you hold these? Can you follow me around and hold these? You can trade after, too. That's cool. Edley, that's a large. I got a medium. I don't know, guys. 
Medium. What's up, bro, man? Sorry. Now you all are seeing why I don't play sports. XL. Come on, bro. You know what? I'm sorry. You know what's so cool about dudes? Guys, if we did this with women where we called their sizes out. <laughs> I think I'd get fired. <laughs> Adam. W one more medium. Need a guy my size. Can you guys, can you wear a medium? Yeah? What's up? There you go. Happy Father's Day. So, this is why. It's the same shirt I've got on. If we got the sizes wrong, trade around. If yours doesn't fit you, call the office and we'll get you another one. My darling daughter, Erin, drew me this during worship today, and it's our family. And so she gave it to me today because her heart was full of love. And that really is, um, that's the heart we want to share today on Father's Day is the Father heart of God. I had a whole bunch of really neat notes this week and no real trajectory um, I was telling Nathan about it. He's like, you good for Sunday? I'm like, yeah, I got a ton of notes, and I got no idea what the trajectory or where I point them. That was like Wednesday. And he's like, that's really cool. It's like you've got a full quiver and a bow and arrow, and you just don't know where to point it yet. And I was like, yeah, that's true. And then last night, I was driving home from working on our house, and I was at Bay of Vista and Macintosh at the stoplight. And in a flash... The Lord downloaded exactly what I needed today, and it's, not a, it's only some of what I had. It's not a lot, so today's going to be kind of fast and loose, but that's good. The Lord can have his way. The word last week about shepherding was so, um, oh, that was so good. What a great way to run into Father's Day. We don't coordinate this as much as you might think. It's the Holy Spirit that puts these things together. Let's focus our hearts on the Lord and pray. Father, you are the great shepherd. You are Abba Father. You are everything to us. Lord, as was prayed uh, at the beginning of service today in pre-service prayer, would you reveal, would you reveal to us with purity, through your grace, an unfiltered understanding of your heart, of your identity and who you are. Because it's so great and it's so large and it's so pure and it's so perfect, humanity just can't capture it. So, Father, help us to orient to you as our example. In your name, Jesus, amen. So we're going to be in four verses, four, four sections of the word today. The first is in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. I got to flip there too. So you can just make sound effects while I uh, thumb pages on my iPad. <laughs> that sounded like the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> that was awesome. <clears throat> Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive what? Adoption as sons. And because you're sons, so for this to matter to you, you have to accept and apply the truth that if you've given your life to Jesus, you are an adopted son or daughter of God. Now, we could read right past that and have a great Father's Day message. And if we don't get one more thing landed in our hearts, get this. If you've yielded your life to the Lord, you're a son or daughter to the king. Because if you don't have that, if you don't have that sorted, if you don't have that as reality in your life, everything else is going to be kind of noise. Because you're sons and daughters. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. And that spirit cries out, Abba, Father. 
So that opens the door for us to cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, in Hebrew, is literally, you're my dad. I can say to my own earthly dad, his name's Brent. We named our third child's middle name after him, Wyatt Brent. I can say to my dad, hey, dad. I can say, love you, dad. I can say all those things, dad. And it's different than using the dad in another context, because I'm talking to my dad. And that's what Abba literally means. Dad, you're my dad. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. I want you to take note of this verse. And I'm going to share three more passages of Scripture with you today. And I'm going to ask you, I'm going to look you right in the eyes, and I'm going to say, write down just the references. You don't have to write down every word. Some of y'all take your photo out and, and grab the screen when they're up, whatever suits you. But I want you to read these four passages of Scripture this week in succession because what happens is when we realize we are the adopted sons and daughters of God, then our spirit is free to cry out as sons and daughters to the Most High. Then we walk around knowing what our inheritance is who we are and our identity. And without that, I'm telling you what, there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people who call in the name of the Lord that do not walk as adopted and they walk as orphans. We don't have to be desperate. We don't have to be in that place of solitary discouragement and desperation like, when is this gonna happen for me? How is this gonna work out? God, are you ever going to heal me or my family or my loved one? Is this, is that, ah, that desperate isolation is the voice of an orphan, not an adopted son or daughter. So talking about fatherhood today, there's so many kinds of celebrated uh, fatherhoods that we can celebrate. It all starts with Abba Father. We have earthly dads. Some of us had awesome earthly fathers. Some of us, did not. Some of us had earthly dads we've never met. You've never met. Some of your earthly dads may have not been winners. Because in a fallen world, people do fallen things. But without fathers, not one of us would be here. Amen? It's very important if you had, um, if you had a challenging earthly father or if you lost him at a young age or you didn't know him or there was distance that you surround yourself with spiritual dads. Even if you had a great father, be open to spiritual fathers because not all fathering is biological. There's a really neat thing that happens when you have a situation with a single mom. Maybe some of you have seen this firsthand where that mom has this anointing straight from heaven to bring both voices into her home because there's not another option. Have you guys seen that? It's amazing that the grace of God can express itself that way. Something that's true about fathering is that you cannot, you can't be a father without something to be a father to. If you guys are parents, you know that you love all your children. But the first one, there's always something special about that first one. Because they made you a dad. And that never really goes away. It doesn't mean you love them more. It doesn't mean the other ones are less. It just means when I look at my oldest son, Jay, I remember and I know specifically, he made me a father. And I wouldn't have been a father without that. God thinks of you that same way, by the way. I think it's very interesting that the Lord calls us to father more than children. The Lord calls us to father works and ministries, the body of Christ. The Lord calls us to mentor and father, shepherd those around us. Amen? Amen. talking about who a father is. Going back to what I said at the beginning, isn't it amazing how every one of us, if you had a great dad, you would brag on him. My dad's the strongest dad there is. There's nothing like the strength of a father. I'm not a particularly built guy. There's a lot bigger dudes than me. 
but to my kids, all they want to do is feel my muscles. <laughs> my daughters, such as they are, my daughters, especially, especially Erin, because she's five now, she's almost six, she likes touching my hands. She likes feeling how big and strong they are and how loving they are. There's nothing like the strength of a father. There's nothing like the internal fortitude of a dad. Now, moms, I'm not taking a single thing away from you. Dear Lord, do we need moms. But today's Father's Day. You had your day. <laughs> not really, I was just saying. Fathers are made and wired by God to build. And that's where I really want to focus today. That's where we're going to live. There's nothing like the voice of a father. We talk all about, and we pray, Lord, I want to hear your voice. And we pray for other people. Lord, speak to them. There's nothing like a dad at home. You guys know what I'm talking about. It could be a long, hard day. My wife, the four kids, but I walk in, get off the sofa, put the toys away, clean your room. Man, when my dad spoke like that, it was like, yeah, absolutely. There's nothing like a dad voice. It doesn't even have to be angry. It can be so loving, too, and so gentle. You wrap your kids in a hug and say, everything's okay. I often say that dads are the chief okay officer of the house. Because when I say it's okay and it's going to be okay, they know it will be. Because in my kids' memory, they've never known me to break a promise to them. That trust is pure. That is because I follow the example of our Heavenly Father, by His grace to the best of my ability. We have to be full of the agape love of the Father to be able to do that, guys. Now, I want to talk about Father's building, and this is really what the Lord gave me sitting at the stoplight. The heart of this message came to me in about... 30 seconds, and my phone's sitting in a holder while I'm idling at the stoplight, and I jotted it down in the next three passages really quick and fast. Fathers build. Fathers build. Fathers, I love to build things with wood or with metal. I used to tinker around with electronics a lot. I love to build projects, and, and that does apply, but that's not really specifically what I'm trying to get across to you. Fathers build a life. Fathers look at their families, and I am not just talking about young dads, because you guys that are a generation beyond me, or maybe two, know that this never turns off. My father, there's no expiration date on fatherhood. Write that down. My dad just came and spent two weeks solid with me working on our house. A complete gift of love. He worked hard with me, side by side. And that was such a blessing. And my father-in-law has done similar. He's been over helping me on the house many times. Because fathers build. As a dad, we build a life for our family. And I don't just mean a specific home or some uh, coffee table built out of pallet wood, like Pinterest style. As fathers, we build culture in our homes. There's a tone set by us dads. And I'll tell you, I'm jumping all around here, but there is a real specific attack on the voice of dads. I don't want a rabbit trail right there. I want to come back to it. Just discipline, Chris. Psalm 120. <laughs> My wife's laughing at me. Psalm 127. Open it up. And I have to turn there too. The entirety of my notes today are literally, whoops, there's my picture. That's it. It's all really shorthand. So I didn't copy the Bible verses. Usually I copy the, the Bible verses down so I don't have to go back between things. But God just said, stop trying to be organized and speak from your heart. Because when God's given you the heart of a father, you can't. It's there. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds a house, because Abba Father builds, 
Look at what he's done in your life. He's built you. He has first created and designed us. The most creative entity possible is God. All of our creativity comes from God. God built us. Then, as we submit to him, he actually builds our homes and he builds our lives and he disciples us by putting us around people and giving us direct words. God is a builder. So unless the Lord builds, the people working to build it are wasting their time and they're laboring in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen that try to guard it are losing sleep for nothing. It is vain. It's a waste of time. It's a, it's a false hope to get up really early, to work really hard, to stay up really late, and to eat the bread of sorrows, which is like saying to, to work yourself so hard and be anxious about everything, to try and do it under your own power. The way the world would say, I'm a self-made man, the Bible says it's a vain waste of time because he gives his beloved sleep. In other translations, rest. He gives us rest. In other translations, it says he blesses us, not just with, but in rest. See, there's a false dichotomy. There's this wrong paradigm to live in that says, I gotta go, 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 and build this life. What you're teaching is your kids or your wife or those around you that you influence that it's all on you, and if you don't do it all, it'll all fall apart. That's wrong. His yoke's easy. His burden's light. I was talking to another man before service. The degree with which we see the power and the glory and the healing of the Lord in our life is the degree with which we are surrendered to him. Not how hard we work. Yeah, we work hard. I love working hard. I really do. I think one of the best phrases that I've ever heard sum this up came out of a book. I can't remember the author. The Lord will have to give him credit somehow in your hearts. But it basically says, work like it depends on you, but pray like it depends on God. This idea that work and faith are not incompatible, and they go together, but we work, and we show up, and we build from a place of rest and victory, knowing that it's actually the Lord doing the work. Amen? Verse 3, behold. Behold is this fancy word that means check it out. Kids are a heritage. They're a blessing from the Lord. The fruit that comes from the room is a reward. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are kids in one's youth. Do you remember when I said there's no expiration on fatherhood? So you might be thinking, Chris, this is a great thing to say to guys raising young kids like you, or if you got teenagers in the house, or now I guess young adults, because they stick around sometimes. <laughs> but there's no expiration on fatherhood. Everyone in here, every father, men, I'm talking to you, you're called to be sharpening arrows. I want you to think about sharpening arrows. Imagine there's a battle coming. Imagine you're literally on the battlefield and you're in your, your camp with your, your, your own army. You're, out, you're garrisoned up together and battle's in the morning. And it's the night before the battle. You're not eating and sleeping because tomorrow you may die. If I knew I was going into war tomorrow, you know what I'd be doing? Sharpening my arrows. I'd be sitting around the campfire, sharpening them carefully so that every shot would count. What a calling to be able to sharpen arrows. And again, you may not have any biological children of your own. You may not have kids in the house. You may be a grandpa or a great-grandpa. But men, you're never done sharpening arrows. Never. Happy's the man who has a quiver full of them. They won't be ashamed, and they'll speak. In other translations, they'll speak with boldness and clarity and passion before their enemies. Because you know what? 
when you, without an ounce of pride or arrogance, when you've done a good job at something, you know you have. Amen? That's a real specific guy thing, too. Like when you did good, you're like, I did good. And your chest kind of puffs a little. That's all right. God, the best creator, the best designer, built the heavens and the earth. And he looked on it and said, it's good. There's nothing wrong with that. When you've done good, when you've done well, especially by your children, because it's the costliest thing we will ever do as men. Amen? It's hard. Raising kids will teach you all the things you never wanted to know about yourself. <laughs> you'll say the thing and you'll be like, oh, that was ugly. I got to make that right. Oh, I thought I fixed that years ago. Nope. When you've done good with that and your kids are walking in the fruit of the spirit, you can look at that and say, I have died to so much flesh to sharpen those arrows. Now I can face anything with meek power under control, under restraint, directed as the Lord tells me. Amen? Fathers, build. Fathers, build not just the culture of their home, not just the things in their home, not just a life for their family with providence, but fathers, build legacy. Legacy is an incredibly passionate subject to me because legacy means something that outlasts me. I cannot tell you how many times I interact with my children or, frankly, church, many of you, with the sincere, very sharply focused thought in mind that what I'm doing is for 50 years from now because it's all about later. You guys know the old proverb? It's not uh, necessarily a book of Proverbs. It's, it's the one that says uh, about the guy that plants a tree he'll never sit under. That's a father's word. To plant a tree that he's not going to sit under. That is our opportunity, not only with the kids, but in the places that the Lord puts us to walk in our callings and anointings. To plant trees will never seem grow taller than us. But you know it's going to. Fathers build generations and fathers build legacy for the Lord. Fathers restore. <clears throat> Deeply passionate subject of mine. How many of you guys like watching? Um, there's a myriad of them now. Uh, used to only be on like cable TV. Now there's like YouTube channels. How many of you guys like watching restoration of old cars or furniture, stuff like that? That is so cool. My favorite ones are where they find some car that's not been started in 30 years, and they roll up on this thing, and it is busted. Anybody in their right mind would look at this bucket of rust and say, it'll never go, and if it does, it's not worth it. How many times has that been true of each of us at some point? That's the perspective of God to rebuild and restore. That's why we love TV shows or, or programs like that because it is keying us in to that image of God that we're made in to go walk in his way and bring restoration here. How do we bring restoration here? By connecting people to the heart of God. By restoring their intimacy with the Lord. By saying, look at what Jesus has done in my life. Just like Roger and Myrna are probably going to have a chance to do on the bus. That's how we bring restoration here. There was a word in worship today about prodigals, and um, our uh, intercessors had that very highlighted this morning in prayer. It was about prodigals. <clears throat> this idea that fathers wait, not passively, expectantly. Fathers wait with prayers of faith for the return of their prodigals, for true repentance to happen with their children. My kids are young, and my heart breaks when they're missing something with the Lord, but I'm going to look at you all and say, I cannot imagine what it's like to have a child that's away from the Lord. I hope that I never experienced it, but I was talking to somebody before service that that's a reality, and it is a reality of many. So it is this place of a father to posture themselves between what is 
and what will be and stand in that gap and intercede to connect those two. That's building. Amen? Let's go to Luke 14. talk about the cost of discipleship. Now great multitudes went with Jesus wherever he went, and Jesus turned and he said to them, Jesus' words, red letters, if anybody comes to me and doesn't hate his father and his mother, great word for Father's Day. Perfect. <laughs> it's like, really, God? <laughs> this came at the stoplight, so I'm not going to argue. But we'll, we'll teach into that for a second. It's not talking about literally hating. It's holding it less and holding it loosely. If I don't put my relationship with the Lord before every other earthly relationship, then what I've done is erected an idol in my life. If I put my wife, whom I love dearly, before God in my life, that's an idol. Same with parents. Same with children. My children are a blessing from the Lord. They are not the Lord of my life. Amen? Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you that intends to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost? Whether is enough to finish it? Otherwise, after he's laid the foundation and he's not able to finish, everybody sees it and makes fun of him saying, what an idiot. Did you not figure out how much this is going to cost? Paraphrasing loosely. Or a king that would go out to make war against another king. What, how could he not sit down first and consider, is my army going to stack up against his army? He's got twice the guys I have. Otherwise, the king that's going to go out and make war against him say, he's got 20,000, I got 10,000. Maybe we should try to strike up a truce before we get beat. So likewise, just an example of all those things, just like all those things. Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has can't be my disciple. That doesn't mean that we have to give up every single thing we have. It means we have to hold it loosely enough to put the Lord first and his calling first in our life. Now, this is a subject of great passion to me. I went down the rabbit trail and talked about the attacks on, on fatherhood. And we've seen things like this for a long time. It's not new. You know, shows like, frankly, like Everybody Loves Raymond, where the dad's always an idiot. That's an old show. We've talked about things like that in the past. But I want you to look at, I want you to look at what the world has brought in influence of fatherhood. Fatherhood is responsibility. Amen? There is something really powerful about the first time you find out your wife's pregnant, you're going to be a dad. Am I right, guys? It messes you up. Deep down, I don't care how strong you are, you're like, am I going to have what it takes? This is really real. This is really real. I'm going to have to provide, protect all the things, nurture. There's a life here, and I'm responsible. That. That has been so deconstructed by the world. If fathers, hear me, if, and it's the church's place to do this. It is not the government's place to do this. It's our place, body of Christ, to restore responsibility to fatherhood. It can't be legislated. We're not talking about laws. We're talking about a higher court. The lack of responsibility on fathers and in fathers for their responsibilities, is why abortion continues. That is so focused on moms. And yes, I've heard all that. I understand all that. I'm not taking away from any of it. But what if a couple gets together, commits parenthood outside of marriage? It's been known to happen. And the woman says, 
oh my goodness, I don't know how we're going to do this. I can't do this. And the man involved says, we're going to make this happen. We're going to figure this out together. That is God-given manly responsibility. And it's about time we see it again in the world. And how's the world going to see it if it doesn't come out of the church? Is the church limited to the, I was going to say three square feet, but I wonder around a whole lot more than that. Is, it, is the church limited to this platform? Who is the church? Say it again. Yeah. Say it like you believe it. Yeah. It's time for responsibility to return to fatherhood. When I was first, uh, when I was, <laughs> when we became pregnant first with Jay, my wife's like, you didn't carry no babies? Looking at me funny. <laughs> when Alyssa was first pregnant, I was so ecstatic. I always just wanted to be a dad. And you know what happened? Various men came around, and I say this without condemnation, but it's the truth. Various men from even within, within the church came around me and said words of gloom over me. And we're like, it's hard. It's really difficult. It's really, uh, you know, and they, that's not untrue. It is hard and difficult. And I was so frustrated, and it ignited a passion in me to encourage fathers and to speak life into them. And again, there's no expiration on fatherhood. So men in this room, twice my age, I am speaking life into you. Sharpen your arrows. Bring it. Because it's needed. Where on earth am I? Let's end with Matthew 7. I kind of like taking a few minutes to turn to it. It gives you some pause. You have a little drink of water. The phrase that the Lord gave me was that fathers build. When you think about what you invest when you're fathering something, whether it's a child or a business, a ministry, it's just another way of saying shepherding in some ways. You're investing your life into something, and you're giving out of yourself into it. It's exactly how the Lord treats us. He gives of himself into us. Thank God his supply is infinite. Amen? Amen. Ours is not as earthly fathers, but it can be when we have the grace of God in our lives. But it's so important that as we build, as I send you out to sharpen arrows, if we don't point them in the right direction, it causes destruction. If you don't build on the right foundation, your house will topple. You know, when, um, so we're building our house, right? So, goodness, like almost a year ago, 10 months ago or nine, eight, nine months ago, we were in foundation stage of our house. You can hold the verse for just a minute. I'm going into story mode, evidently. We were in the foundation stages of our home. And they have what they call, I've told this story here once or twice, but they have what they call a soil compaction test where an engineer comes and he checks how compacted or how tightly packed the dirt is under where you wish to put the foundation of your home. Gee, why would that matter? Because if that, small, if that soil compacts after you build your home, it's going to crack. And that is a situation nobody wants to deal with. So, the footers for our home were excavated, and the compaction engineer came out and checked it, and he said, nope, it's too loose. And concrete was scheduled the next day. So, like 4 o'clock in the afternoon after the office, I ran to Home Depot and rented what they call a jumping jack. This is a compactor. You've probably seen them on job sites. It looks like a very, it's a very big, loud, heavy pogo stick 
that you don't ride on, but it goes in front of you and it goes, and it, it weighs like 120 pounds and it just sits there and bounces on the dirt and it just beats it. So I get to, to the site at like five o'clock. I unload this thing, which was funny because it's heavy and I just sort of dumped it out of the truck and get the gas engine started. I've never run one before. It was a lot of fun. It wasn't. I went around my foundation over and over and over. I had never done this before. I had no idea how much I should do this. And I'm like, until it quits moving would be good. Until it, there's no more, no more. I went around that house like 10 times, over and over and over and over. Just, it was dark. I was doing it by headlight by the end. So the compaction engineer comes out bright and early, first thing, right before the concrete guys, checks it. We were betting it would all work, right? Checks it, and he's like, okay, yeah, you're good. <laughs> it was so funny that when we later brought the excavator so tight, later when we brought an excavator over to dig out for some pipes, uh, the guy on it was like, what did you do to this dirt? <laughs> Therefore, Jesus' words, whoever hears what I'm saying and does them, I will liken him. Jesus is comparing the one that hears what Jesus says and does it. Being compared to a man who builds his house on the rock. The rains fall, the floods come, and the winds, and I love this phrase, blew, and they beat on the house. Has anyone in this room weathered a hurricane? Like, I'm talking to the locals. You've been through a legit hurricane? I'm talking three and above, y'all. Because we don't pay attention to, like, ones and twos here. And you know what it's like to have your home beat by the wind and to hear it make your home groan, and your windows shake and rattle. Life rattles us. It's like Jeff and Mel. A motorcycle accident is rattling. Our baby, brand new baby, the Bratchers, in the hospital. That is the wind beating on your home. Marriage on the rocks. That's the wind beating on your house. Jobs lost, the wind. You build your house on the rock and it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these things that I'm saying, Jesus' words, and doesn't do them, he's a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell, and the floods came. And when the wind blew and it beat on that house, it fell, and great was its fall. I don't think there's one of us in this room that has not experienced a great fall in our lives. When we came to understand, we built on sand. When we built on our own words, when we built on our own way, when we built not on the words of Jesus. Everybody has had a great fall, unique to the human experience. We all have. And so it was when Jesus had ended these things that the people were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one having authority, not just as the scribes, not as the teachers. Will you stand up with me? Women here, women hearing this later or online today, I don't, I don't want you to feel neglected. This hasn't been a message necessarily oriented all towards you. Women build. Women do many things. There's nothing like a mother to voice into a situation. But today is all about fathering. So men, take these four passages read them, study them, and take before the Lord this question, where have you called me to build? Now, if you have kids, that's easy. There you go. Yes.
But there's more. There's more than just that. In your callings, in the places the Lord has you, that you haven't been bold enough yet to stick your head through and say, yes, I'm going to walk in it. He's calling you to build. The places where we have doubt are usually the places the Lord wants us to grow and excel, and we have doubt there because the enemy is after us to not be explosive and powerful in those places. So look at the places you have doubt and say, God's calling me to build in this. Lord, for every man in this room that knows and is saying, yes, Chris, I know I'm called to build, but this, but that, but I can't, but my past, but my future, but my abilities, but my life. For every one of those buts, right now, Holy Spirit, meet every one of those doubts and every one of those places where we've put belief in something larger than you or we've made something larger than you. Father, I thank you that this room is full of arrow sharpeners, men and women who have given their lives and will continue to, to sharpen arrows, to fill a quiver, to be effective for your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you'd grant them clarity on when and where to launch those arrows. I pray, Father God, that those in this room that have already launched theirs, their quiver would be refilled with fresh arrows, with fresh targets, with fresh work to do. Father, I thank you for the restoration of godly fatherhood and responsibility in our own hearts and from this place of our heart out into the world around us. Would you just agree with that right now, church? Can we just intercede for that for a moment? Right now in your name, Jesus, we cry out to you. We cry out to you deep, call into deep within each of us and speak to us the places where we can bring those influences. Father, we repent for putting that hope anywhere but you. We know that your church is your expression here on the earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven in the place of fatherhood. We will not look to the government to legislate righteousness because it's already your law and your laws are higher. So Father, through us, Bring that restoration. Through every church and every pulpit that's preaching your word today, Father's Day, bring restoration of fatherhood in the body of Christ in ways we can't even understand yet because we're not there all the way. Restore fatherhood so that we, as your church, can model it for the world. Because if we'll model fatherhood for the world, Watch abortion fall from the face of the earth. Watch violence fall from the place of the earth. Because if we model fatherhood, now sons learn they don't have to be aggressive. Now daughters learn that they're safe and secure. Now young women can grow up powerful and secure with a loving father in the home. Instead of being taught they have to fend for themselves. So in the name of Jesus, we declare a restoration of fatherhood, not only here in this house, but across the body of Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Can we praise the Lord like that's done already? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The word says to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. So if today is a hard day for you, big hugs. If today's a blessing for you and a celebration, big hugs, but different kinds. If it's both, both can be true. If you need prayer today, a few of us will be up front to pray with you after service. Hug some guys today.
Wish them happy Father's Day. Go get some sugar in the family room. Amen. We love you, church. See you next week.